Hey, and welcome to the next episode of Deep Talks. My today's guest is Greg Larkin, author of the best-selling book, This Might Get Me Fired. So Greg, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And cheers. Cheers. We are drinking a special Japanese green tea that has three times more L-tannin and some other amino acids. So we're going to be much more intelligent, creative. And I don't, I don't this is a key ingredient of my podcast. So cheers. Cheers. Wow. This one was very strong. The next will be less strong. I promise. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> it's unlike any green tea I've ever had. Yeah, and wait for the effect. <laughs> So, uh, you want to just do some calculus? <laughs> <laughs> so, me and Greg, we met a few days ago here in Prague. Uh, we drank some beers and we had a nice discussion. And that was the moment I decided to shoot this podcast. And then Greg uh, had his talk at uh, Web Expo, that is one of the biggest conferences here in Central Europe about startups, IT, and those kind of things. So, Greg, tell me, uh, the core of your book is about innovations, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you are helping like big corporations to deploy some uh, strategies that are uh, from the world of uh, startups. Mm -hmm. So, and your way is punk way. That is very, very uh, important to me because I was playing in a punk band when I was in high school. So tell me more about how to disrupt big corporations with punk mode. Uh, yeah, so you have to basically listen to a lot of uh, Black Flag <laughs> and uh, the Ramones. Let's start, let's start there, let's start with the music. Uh, there's a few key ingredients that you need. Um, number one, though, I think is that uh, an awareness that the cost of not innovating has never been higher. Right. And what I see in a lot of companies where they start to talk about innovation and do innovation, they focus on problems that no one really needs to solve. <laughs> so they'll have a design thinking lab or, you know, they're not really going into the core of the company's earnings. And when, you, when you're not solving the burning building inside the yeah. organization, you never have the mandate to change. You never have the power that you need to kill an old way of doing business. And you're never really going to have an opportunity to take a punk entrepreneur and have them do the best work of their life. So building block number one is urgency. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me ask you, like, why they are not focusing on what is important? Like, is it a lack of courage or? Hierarchy. Hierarchy. Um, I think hierarchy is the enemy of innovation. Uh, when you're in a hierarchy, uh, you're focused on going from being an associate vice president to a senior vice president. You're focused right. on why Jane down the hall got promoted before you. You're focused on why, why John uh, is making more money than you. You're focused on what do you have to do to get invited out to a golf game mm -hmm. with the CEO? How come you weren't invited into that meeting? Yeah. And, you know, I've achieved many of those things and it's horrible. Like, I've had meetings with very big CEOs that throw chairs and, like, scream <laughs> at people. Like, it's not, it's not an enjoyable way to live your life. But, you know, something that happens in a hierarchy is that your own sense of your own performance mm -hmm. starts to become defined by your status in the chain of command. Right. Rather than in a startup, which is... How fast are we solving a problem that the world has and can't solve without us? How much return on investment are we making? Mm -hmm. um, there is hierarchy in startups, sure, but it always comes second to that first thing, which is we're going to run out of money if we don't make this work. Yeah, and, right. um, so I, I think hierarchy is the enemy of innovation in huge companies, even though we live in a disruption economy mm -hmm. where huge companies are, are put out of business or lose market share or lose sales to disruptive startups every day. Okay, that, that's uh, even my experience. I'm living uh, like two blocks from Wall Street in financial dis district in Manhattan. 
And what I feel is that uh, this <laughs> neighborhood is very transactional. Like everyone is really ego driven. And what I feel is that, what do you said? Like they are uh, focusing on growth on a hierarchy or reaching a higher, higher position. But I feel that uh, there is no higher purpose. There is uh, nothing like, like uh, some, there, there is nothing deeper there than. Uh, I think Wall Street, it's a little strange, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're a trader on Wall Street, you, especially, especially in New York, which is different than, say, Deutsche Bank or mm -hmm. UBS. Um, Deutsche Bank, if you're a bad trader, you still don't get fired. Right. In, in Frankfurt, anyway. Uh -huh. um, Deutsche Bank in New York, if you have a bad trade, you're, you're out the door in a minute. So there is, um, you are come, only... Come on. I, I heard a story from New York Times that they had some bad trades with uh, Donald Trump and they still are uh, his bankers, so... <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, but they made a lot of money from lending him that money. Yeah. And yeah, he was a bad... They, they miscalculate all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, Wall Street is as just as smart and just as stupid as every other industry. Okay. Um, but unlike... Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're working on an investment bank trading floor, um, the money eventually is going to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. um, you can only live that lie for so long. I think it's insane how long some people in that environment can play the hierarchy to prevent themselves from actual real accountability. Um, it's why I think a lot of those traders move on to hedge funds, which mm -hmm. are essentially the startups of a trading floor. Right. Um, but Wall Street is a, a sort of a different beast. My time in there was that everyone knows how to play the game. Everyone knows exactly how to take credit for something that they didn't do. Um, by the time I became senior in big finance, uh, one of the things that was really hard for me to reconcile with mm -hmm. is that um, actual making money wasn't my job anymore. It was my job to understand who was trying to kill me. Okay. And it was my job to prevent myself from being killed. Okay. And it was 70% politics, 30% capital markets. Okay. And the more senior you got, that became essentially your job. Uh -huh. um, that, was a, a, that was a hard thing to recognize. And the minute I kind of had that bolt of awareness that that's what it, my life had become, I'm like, I quit. I'm mm -hmm. out. I'm done. And uh, you shared a story on a, on a stage of, uh, at Web Expo that uh, you predict the financial crisis uh, in 2008. Yeah. And that was quite an interesting story that uh, after that, uh, all uh, lawyers were after you. So can you tell us more about that? Because <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit, I already told 3,000 people, I guess, the other day. So I might as well tell some more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, in 2005, this investment research startup called InnoVest uh, hired me um, without any experience either in a startup or in, in investment research. And they, they hired me to analyze the banking sector. And the question they wanted me to answer was, is the booming housing market going to last? <laughs> um, <laughs> Now we know that it wasn't. <laughs> right. And uh, not knowing very much about how to, I knew how to answer one question. The most intuitive way to go about solving that and answering that was, all right, well, let's look at the borrowers. How much money are they taking out? Um, how granular can we get the data to go in terms of like postal codes, for example, versus the country versus the state? Can we figure out who's lending money to which borrowers, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, uh, I, 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 the, the key figures are this. Um, real wages had gone down by 4% for five straight years. During that same time, borrowing, meaning household debt, had spiked by 72% during the same time. And... The banks that were the most exposed to it were Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and Countrywide mm -hmm. Financial. 
And that yeah. was your prediction. That, that was my prediction. It's going to collapse. And, um, you know, as a startup, so if you felt like you were right, there was very little oversight. I could mm -hmm. say whatever I wanted. Yes, I had some people checking the numbers and kicking the tires and, you know, um, fact checking and, and, and checking on my analysis. But it was a startup in a world where everyone had so many layers of bureaucracy and corruption, for that matter, in finance at that time. And that became uh, the first prediction, public prediction, of the 2008 <laughs> financial crisis. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> um, that's like the superhero version of the story. The reality is that all the banks that I was predicting were going to be in trouble um, were also our clients. And within minutes of uh, releasing the report, my phone rings, and it's the, the top lawyer from Lehman Brothers. <laughs> Saying you're going to be named in a lawsuit, and then after that, another phone call, and it was uh, we're going to you're going to be named in another lawsuit from another bank. And like by five o'clock on the first day of my first product launch, I was wow. going to be named in six lawsuits by the seven like the six largest <laughs> banks in New York, and seventy percent of our uh, clients on the banking industry had just disappeared. Oh, that's the great success for the first uh, product. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Uh, thankfully, I had an amazing CEO uh -huh. who knew exactly how to play the game. And uh, I called him to say, look, you should fire me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I put you in this position. Uh, I have no business in this business. And Matthew Kiernan, God bless that man, said, um, hold on. You weren't wrong. They don't like your conclusions, but mm -hmm. no one has been able to say that your facts were wrong. This is what right. they do mm -hmm. when they want to scare you. And the way you respond is you say it louder. Mm -hmm. And you force them to fight you louder. So if any of them follows through on their threat, I'm going to take out a full page ad in the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal uh, publishing your report and publishing their response keep going okay and in reality um that's the only reason we were able to have that prediction okay because he there were people on wall street that had much better technology much better analytical capability much smarter people than me who as soon as they saw the same thing and got that same phone call, their boss would say, are you crazy? You put that report away. What is wrong with you? You know, and I, I think that's a really important lesson for startups. Um, if you're right and you're onto something, people are going to try to kill you. Okay. And um, that is ultimately the validation you need to know mm -hmm. that you're, what you're building matters. Mm -hmm. Opposition is validation. And I think a lot of startups, when they start to gain traction and they start to experience the reaction of all of the competitors, right. um, they, uh, they don't know how to handle that. They don't have a CEO that will stand up in that way, the way that Matthew stood up for me. Um, you know, a lot of times they think their job is to build something on the blockchain or to get more artificial intelligence involved. <laughs> We did that whole thing with, uh, I think, two servers in our closet and like uh, uh, a Microsoft uh, Access database and like Excel. Okay. <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, and then uh, this company was uh, bought with someone, mm -hmm. and uh, then what happened? So we got acquired by a wonderful company called Risk Metrics. Mm -hmm. um, which actually was founded the same time that InnoVest was founded. But we grow, we did a good job as the financial crisis, especially materialized and people started to realize that we knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. um, we did great, but risk metrics was much larger than us. Mm -hmm. um, they were a spinoff from JP Morgan and they were... Uh, so they already had those uh, corporate uh, habits? Not quite. It's interesting. Um, they 
spun off from JP Morgan's because they realized that in order to get the technologists and to attract the entrepreneurs into their organization, they had to be a startup. They had to be able to take the talent that might otherwise go to Google and Facebook and Amazon okay. and attract them and create a culture where they can do their best work. So that was a very entrepreneur friendly company. There were no job titles. Um, the CEO was a guy called Ethan Berman. He, although he was one of the biggest names on Wall Street or among them anyway, um, completely normal, regular, approachable mm -hmm. guy. Um, he really made a point to know, make sure everyone felt comfortable coming directly to him. It was very flat. It lasted, however, for only nine months because Risk Metrics got acquired nine months after they bought us. Okay. And the company that bought Risk Metrics was extremely hierarchical. Okay. And everyone had a job title and everyone could not speak to your boss's boss without permission from your boss. And there was absolutely nothing went on without authorization. And everything went through an annual business planning mm -hmm. process. And there was like eight months of PowerPoint reviews. And what was funny about it is that was my first experience of big corporate hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And everything died. Everything died. So you the clash the, between those two cultures. You, they were, they, I think what, 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 when they did the acquisition of risk mm -hmm. metrics, I think what they thought they were buying was incredible technology and a winning mm -hmm. sales strategy. And we can just superimpose our culture and mm -hmm. our hierarchy on top of that technology and we'll make it work better. And the opposite happened. All the technology broke. All the talent left. Uh, and a lot of that talent went on to work for competitors that stole market share away. Okay. Um, you know, and if you look at it on mm -hmm. paper, like this is a dream acquisition. If you look at it in culture, hmm. it was completely predictable that it would fall apart. Um, and then while that was sort of unraveling, I then uh, went to Bloomberg where I became the head of innovation at Bloomberg. But Bloomberg is also like a big corporation. So how was the culture there? Uh, terrible. <laughs> Throwing chairs, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there are pockets of the organization which are great. Um, it was, it was really, uh, it was very interesting. I'm glad I went through it. Um, but that was a, a huge uh, fintech powerhouse. That was really one of the original fintech powerhouses. And it was in the middle of getting disrupted. Mm -hmm. You know, better, better, faster, cheaper, smarter technology was emerging everywhere from people like at risk metrics mm -hmm. that were like slowly taking away different pockets of the Bloomberg customer base uh -huh. for much less money, for much greater speed. And it was my job to incubate new products to remain competitive and remain relevant in the, in the middle of that. And um, again, you know, the hierarchy made that extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, it was a culture of fear. It was a culture of control. Right. And mm -hmm. it was not a culture of entrepreneur empowerment. Mm -hmm. And um, I still built a lot of products there that I'm very proud of that made a huge amount of money. Um, some of them are still doing great. Right. They still live on a Bloomberg terminal. Uh -huh. um, but I, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it, was, it sort of took me a while to realize, and that's really where the book started actually, mm -hmm. was during that time where I'm like, what? What's re like the only thing that could keep me sane at like two in the morning when I would wake up and be like, what am I doing with my life? You know, <laughs> um, the only thing that would keep me sane was writing. Um, okay, that's, that's the best therapy, actually. Yeah, I would just start writing. Like what if we were to zoom out and like yourself 10 years from now mm -hmm. looks back on what you're going through right now. What is this? You know, and I got some perspective and I, I started to writing about it and writing about the absurdity of it, that mm -hmm. a company who embraces innovation but will, it, it clings to the hierarchy at the same time, 
and is more afraid of change than they are of extinction. And, you know, some of the insights, I started to, I could go back to sleep after I did, I was writing that. And a lot of that became this book. Okay. Cool. Um, many iterations later. Many. Um, so in, and now your book became bestseller in yeah. many countries. So I guess that you have a lot of feedback. So do you think that companies are taking your message seriously or they are still like on the way to extinction? Uh, it, the book is, I think they are taking it seriously. Um, it's really interesting what the reaction has been to the book because a lot of, uh, and, and especially, you know, after I left Bloomberg and I, I built ReCorp, my current company, I just made a, a, a promise to myself. Next time I'm in front of a very senior executive with power, um, I'd rather have them kick me out of their office mm -hmm. than, than be someone other than the punk entrepreneur who I actually am. Okay. And I, I just, I couldn't live the lie of being um, uh, like a corporate, you know, nobody anymore. Uh -huh. And so I was, um, you know, one of my first clients was, was a 183-year-old accounting firm called PwC. Okay. And I met with the senior partner at PwC, and he's talking to me about the product. And I kind of cut him off in the middle, and I surprised myself. Mm -hmm. as he's telling me about the strategy and what he wants to achieve. And I said, everything you're saying about this, it was a really cool product. I don't need to go into the details. Everything you're saying sounds awesome. I understand why it's urgent. And you seem like a nice guy. I just went through five years of the worst corporate, political, civil war. And I don't have the stomach for another one. And... I don't mind fighting. You have to fight for something in a big organization, but there's a lot of things that if we're going to do this right, I'm going to do it in a way that you've never seen before with people you've never worked with before. You're going to have a lot of people that you've worked with for a long time. I'm going to piss them off. <laughs> And if you're not comfortable with that, because for this to work, it requires a huge amount of political risk and political strength on your part. And if you're not prepared for that, then I'm going to wish you the best of luck and walk out of here right now. So basically, he became a uh, godfather. He became the godfather. Y you described this uh, role uh, in your presentations. So you have to have someone from the corporation that uh, like makes a, a space for you to innovate or... Not just a space. Uh, yes, making space is part of it, but um, their job is anytime you encounter resistance, and mm -hmm. that resistance is something other than the fact that the technology is very difficult or it's physically impossible and we don't know how, the resistance you get is a bullshit excuse for can't. Okay. You tell me, and I'm going to clear that blocker out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will use my political power inside of this organization to fight for you and enable you to go as fast as you can. So this role should be very enlightened. Like it should be it's, like someone that uh, is very uh, courageous and it's with it a lot of power. It sounds power. that way. It sounds like it uh -huh. should be someone who's very courageous. And and that courage is certainly part of it. Absolutely. It's never like you know, the Rocky theme music up in the background, mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's fight this thing together. It's always someone who just <clears throat> got their ass kicked. To a, like it's everyone who's been in that position who takes that kind of a stand has experienced disruption. Mm -hmm. And they are so frustrated by their corporation's inability to get out of its own way. And every godfather has that as their origin story that's where it starts it's almost always um an act of desperation first and an act of courage second mm -hmm. right and uh, how about the fact that uh the average lifespan of uh those uh big managers in corporation is very shor short so if you lose your godfather then what like uh everything is lost or well 
that's a, it's funny you say it that way though. When you say everything is lost, what do you mean? Like I, I experienced the similar situation here in one bank that they had a punk uh, group of invaders and then the sea level changed and uh, the bank had some uh, big changes in their uh, management level. And what I uh, saw was that everything changed then and uh, they lost the ability to innovate it fast and it was so sad. The bank lost? Mm. The people that were part of the punk I think punk that many, unit? Many, many of those punks left. Right. So, and they probably went on to do the best work of their life afterwards. Right. Yeah, probably. My point being is that the risk of not being able to keep those punks mm-hmm. punk yeah. <laughs> isn't the punks. The, someone who's a punk entrepreneur is literally the most valuable and scarce talent of our generation. Mm-hmm. There is a huge pool of capital dying to invest in them. There is a huge group of, of, of consumers and customers that want nothing more mm-hmm. than to stop buying a product or a service from a huge old company and to back a startup instead. Right. That is the biggest consumer trend of our of our lifetime. Mm-hmm. And that a company kicks that group out of the organization because they don't like that. Right. Then the company has to go and contend with that trend without punks who know how to navigate it. Yeah. And so like yeah, it, it, so the, how, if the how godfather to leaves, how, how to prevent that because uh I I think it's very sad even for those punks that they are working on a meaningful project and then uh, somehow they uh, know that they are uh, under the influence of the Godfather and then when he left uh, or when he he's uh, somehow uh, pushed away then what what, what uh, how we can prevent that because it, it's uh, for me to be that uh, punk uh, it would be scary to work on a project and be just under influence of one one people. so if you're a punk person. and you have no Godfather and uh-huh. and Look, I think what the Godfather has to do is build a coalition of Godfathers. That's okay. their job. Well, I, I was living in Mulberry Street, so th- there was a lot <laughs> of had, those guys. <laughs> you actually had five Godfathers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, a huge thing that a Godfather needs to be able to do is, is make Godfathering the mm-hmm. executive norm. Right inside okay. that company and in the same way that the punk's job is to create a, a sort of snowball of exponential market validation mm-hmm. and growth uh, that has to be matched by exponential stakeholder validation okay and that's the godfather's job that's not simply can we have your money and can we have your support it's like you better have five people by the end of this sprint mm-hmm who have as much power as you inside this company that are also going to fight for this. Okay. And if what they're basically doing is not having that and not using their power to build that coalition and make it so that the person who resists it is resisting it alone. Okay. Their job is to take the political balance of power inside of a huge company and built that balance of power toward entrepreneurship and away from hierarchy. That's their job. Right. And that's a huge piece of organizational change. It takes bravery. It doesn't work unless they've gotten their ass kicked by not doing that before. They will never understand why that has to happen and why that's got to be their legacy inside Mm -hmm. of the firm. But it happens. I've seen it work. I've seen it take root. In fact, I would argue that, um, uh, you know, you heard me say it on stage, but I think the first generation of great startups were all launched in college dorm rooms. Um, The next generation of great startups are going to be punk godfather couples. (laughs) Right. That's great. Emerging out of the biggest companies in our time. Um, And and I think we're we're very early. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not normal. It's in certain industries, it's become more normal. And companies that like Facebook and Google that started as startups, it's, it's a little bit more Yeah, normal. they have a little bit different culture than uh, the big banks. 
very so, different culture. So, <laughs> yeah. They're um, more open minded to. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Kind of innovations. It, well, even Google, though, they have Google and then they have Alphabet. Right. Yeah. And the job of Google is to make sure that their established products work and don't break mm-hmm. and keep making money. The job of Alphabet and X is constantly be trying stuff, constantly do things to reinvent an industry with the expectation that it's a venture studio, really trying to solve some of the hardest problems of our time. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Could there be a venture studio that tries to completely disrupt the investment banking world? Yeah, that could happen. Okay. Could there be a venture studio that tries to completely disrupt corporate law? I think so. So, and uh, do they have any like uh, new products? Because uh, I remember last uh, cool Google products that they are really old, like Google Maps and uh, Gmail. But what was the last cool product made um, by Google? Like the really like with a huge scale. Hmm. A really good question. I mean, I've seen prototypes mm-hmm. of things that are in beta um, that are great, um, but I can't. Not great. Very useful, mm-hmm. practical. Okay. I can't think of the last time there was a new product to come out of Google mm-hmm. that was like, yeah. "Wow, that is revolutionary." That right. just completely yeah. ripped apart industry X. I can see exactly how that's going to happen. It's, What's interesting though, uh-huh. you know, while I worked in finance, uh, I was part of the team that built one of the first commercially viable robo-advisors. Mm-hmm. I was part of the team that built one of the first commercially viable um, algorithm trading platforms. You know, I built a lot of these technologies. All the entrepreneurs who were part of those teams, like myself, either quit or got fired. And a lot of those technologies have gone on to destroy the wealth management industry. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of what used to be an army of 25-year-olds with an MBA trying to figure out how to make sense of something like the Arab Spring That's now a startup called Kensho, which just got acquired for seven hundred million dollars. You know, and so I, I think I'm more inclined, I would say, to look into that industry to see where the disruption is coming from. But the things that are like very definitive game changers, mm-hmm. where I see the technology and I see the platform, and I can kind of envisage ten years from now mm-hmm. how a huge part of the banking industry won't be there anymore. Um, most of that's happening in in enterprise finance, in like the investment banking trading side of bank of, of finance. That's for me. That's thrilling. Okay. Um, so, and your your uh, newest uh, company that you uh, founded, uh, uh, Recorp. Yeah. And tell me more about this because uh, it's very interesting that you are connecting like the ex founders. With corporation, so explain us your business model. Sure. Uh, so Recorp is a coalition of 96 exited startup founders who have sold their startups for more than 10 million dollars, and we enlist those uh, entrepreneurs as like consulting Navy SEALs mm-hmm. inside of some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, So they go in for 12 weeks. They will either launch a new product or turn around a failing product or both. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they'll stay on as an advisor afterwards. Um, we only work with uh, C-suite executives. We, we insist on having a godfather that has the power to mm-hmm. clear the path. Um, and uh, we've, we've, we've launched... 34 different engagements. Wow, that's cool. Um, yeah. Our average return on investment. We're very focused on ROI in our projects. What we don't want to do is get into the trap of being an innovation consulting firm where the, the company walks away and they have a bunch of post-it <laughs> notes yeah. and like an Adobe design yeah. file. Um, so what we do want to do is solve a problem where the company will lose money if they mm-hmm. do not solve it. And we want to solve it in, in eight to twelve weeks with the best entrepreneurs in the world. 
Okay, so basically you have to know uh, all weaknesses of th- those companies and be able to destroy them. Yeah, we're basically enabling them to build and own a startup that would be very scary for them if, <laughs> if they did not build it or own it. Okay. And that's phase one. Phase two is you need to understand just how fast and effective people that are outside of your system can operate in mm-hmm. your market. You happen to have an opportunity to work with them as allies mm-hmm. through us. There's other people like that outside. Right. And outside of the four walls of your organization, there are competitors. Um, you need to know that. Mm-hmm. I think something that happens inside of very big companies is that there's this um, assumption that everyone who's competing against you is as old, big, and slow as you are. Mm-hmm. It's not true anymore. Right, yeah. And a lot of the competitive strategies that are built and launched inside of these huge companies are very effective if everyone else trying to steal customers and win market share from you is as old, big, slow as you mm-hmm. are. With Recorp, they get to understand fundamentally that, no, it's, it's, it's six people who have a track record of going from zero to one and then from one to a hundred and, and, uh, at a speed that's never been accomplished mm-hmm. before. Uh, let me discuss another idea. My experience uh, in New York was that there is a, a lot of startups and what I f- feel there is that uh, there is more money than uh, good ideas. And uh, what I felt is that... I'd like all of that money, please. <laughs> <laughs> and what I felt is that uh, sometimes like uh, those founders are just motivated to do uh, IPO and to uh, have new investors, but at the end, like it's very short-term business. For example, great example of this is uh, Uber that never uh, get to the uh, green numbers. And I think that uh, they started uh, with 45 bucks and now they are uh, selling uh, for 35. Mm -hmm. So basically the only first investors, they uh, get good money out of it and the rest are uh, a little bit fucked up. So Uh, that was my experience there that uh, the founders are not uh, solving great problems and they are only focusing on how to get to IPO as fast as possible. Not, n- not all of them, but uh, like 90%. So I, I, think, uh, I think that's partially true. Uh-huh. Um, yes, uh, the job of a startup founder is to focus on an exit. That's, that's part of life. You have to do it. I don't know. I think that diminishes mm-hmm. the, the, when you look at someone like our recorpers, um, many of them have had two or three exits. Mm-hmm. They're not so excited about getting to an exit after the first one and after the second one. Mm-hmm. They're twice as smart. They understand all the false promises of it. Oh. Um, they do understand, and also they've gotten killed being selling their their child basically to the highest bidder, and and it's even if they're very rich because mm-hmm. of it, um, there's a certain amount of soul that was crushed along the way. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I've been that uh, entrepreneur, and 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 I've experienced it, and um, that's not a small reason for that matter why mm-hmm. why a lot of the exited entrepreneurs work with Recorp, like. We know what they've gone through. Yeah, and, and they, they need a new, new purpose in life, I guess. Like well, to do something meaningful, not to just enjoy their money because I guess that, uh, okay, it can be fun like half a year, a year, and then they should go back to work. No one, most, everyone, if you start up, uh, anyone who's launched a startup, you, you, not anyone, some people are very uh, rich when they launch a startup, but mm-hmm. For everyone else who launches a startup, you're living in pretty destitute poverty for a Mm -hmm. long time. You're not paying yourself. It's not glamorous. Mm -hmm. Whatever you've been fed by Inc. Magazine or like Fast Company with like uh, organic food buffet, (laughs) like, you know, like a koi pond or whatever. It's bullshit. That's not how it is. Um, Very scrappy. The pressure of not knowing how you're going to make your next dollar is terrifying. Mm -hmm. 
um, trying to persuade investors to give you runway where you know that you need the runway right now, mm. but you don't want them as a partner over the long haul. Mm. That's anyone who's ever gone through an early stage startup has experienced that. And that'll dissuade you of any romanticism mm -hmm. of it pretty fast. And it makes you a better second time founder and a better third time founder. Um, and it's, uh, l let me uh, go deeper in this uh, idea because I think that the uh, entrepreneurs like 50 years ago, they were much more focusing on build something stable like family business and uh, to build something even for their kids. Sure. And now it's like about like five years and sell it, maybe three years and sell it. So I feel that in terms of uh, meaning, it's much, much uh, like more risky or, uh, for example, I have my company. 14, transactional. Four, transactional. Yeah, I have my company 14 years and 14 years uh, and I want to have it another 50 years because sure. I love what I do. I don't want to... Um, sell it i don't want to exit and i really love what i do and i could not imagine myself to only focus on a like exit and then what like so it's very different yeah. to me and that was uh, my first experience when i moved to new york that uh, i'm a little bit different entrepreneur than all those guys there yeah um i think that's accurate i think you're also in a different Uh, the way you make money is different than a typical startup because mm -hmm. you're ultimately a consultant. Well, yeah. Um, and that's not exactly the same thing as having a product mm -hmm. and a digital or otherwise that's in the market and, and that has to be sold. Like you're, you're building something for your clients every time you have them. And so I think the difference between an entrepreneur consultant Typically, the business model there is uh, we want to generate enough cash flow mm -hmm. from having smart people doing smart work for good clients that uh, we don't ever have to sell ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. We should be able to be cash flow positive right out of the gate. Recorp uses entrepreneurs as consultants. Right, yeah. We're so cash flow positive right out of the You have a very similar business model as we have, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you were to ever sell, um, the best you can hope for is like a multiple of 2x. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were a product company, right, yeah. you're looking at yeah. a 20x multiple. So right. it's not even like a consulting exit is never, in my view, yeah. it's very rarely worth it. That's why we have some uh, scalable products like online courses because you can sell the online course like exponentially. Yeah. So that's that's the difference between doing consulting and have a sc scalable product. So we now feel that we need to have more of those products. Yeah. So and you basically describe the uh, main reason of that. Yeah. But the, the there's a I also want to point something else out, which is that the New York. Um, Startup ecosystem is mm -hmm. very different than the West Coast startup ecosystem because in New York, first of all, it's mostly business to business mm -hmm. products. You are revenue positive. Very, you're, you're looking for one flagship client who's mm -hmm. a million dollar contract, mm -hmm. not a million users that maybe their data can be monetized or maybe they go from like five percent of them go from like free to paid mm -hmm. um, where it's it's not a really uh, an app store based mm -hmm. ecosystem in New York um, okay so you are looking at like very conventional big sales teams that are looking to land a big paying client a um, little different whereas in, in on the west coast what you're describing I think is more the norm mm -hmm. where We have an AI-based platform. We kind of have an idea that there are three, you know, Silicon Valley, um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Oracle, whatever, that are, need this AI platform to work inside of their company or will do it better than they can. Mm -hmm. And it, we're, we're hoping that they buy it once it's starting to work mm -hmm. at scale. Um, that is the business model out there. And you can, you can get investors on board um 
based on the fact that they can predict what what um, enterprise buyers are, mm-hmm. are are waiting for that to gain traction. In New York, it's a little different. Even at Innovest, my startup, you know, we our clients were hedge funds and mm-hmm. uh, huge banks, and and we were very focused on like large contract value. Um, okay. Me as a product manager, for example, I knew who our clients were. I was in their office. I encouraged them to be in our office, mm-hmm. even when they hated me because I had the misfortune of covering <laughs> banks. Um, <laughs> um, but they respected me. Can I tell you a funny story about that? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to name the person's name, um, but one of the banks that Fought me the hardest when Mm -hmm. my first uh, 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 product came out predicting the financial crisis was uh, Citigroup. Mm -hmm. And unlike the other banks, they didn't quite go up the food chain right away. They sent someone who was quite new to the company to call me. And by that time, they were like the seventh or eighth bank to to, to say, like, yeah, we're going to sue you and we're going to kill your company and whatever. And um, so there was this woman who calls me at the office. She says, we're going to sue you, da-da-da. And by that time, Matthew, my CEO, had given me the talk. Like, tell them, full-page ad, naming them, (laughs) publishing the report, say it louder. So at that point, I'm like, all right, you give me the green light to stand up for myself. Uh, You're damn right. Like, I'm going to be pretty badass. So she calls, and I'm Mm -hmm. like, I'm glad you called. So we were waiting for you to call. Uh-huh. Um, thank you for proceeding with your lawsuit. We look forward to that. And because that's what you're going to do, you're, that we've like, we're, we're booking a full page ad, publishing the report, publishing your name, publishing your company's name tomorrow uh-huh. in the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. And, and she's like, wow. <laughs> um, so that's going to happen. You've got three hours. You know, if, if we hear her otherwise, here's my cell phone number. Please don't call me after seven o'clock. I'm speaking on a panel tonight. You know, mm-hmm. I was a dick. And, um, and she was like, okay, this is not what I expected. Um, can you just give me a minute? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> and I was like, you can take a minute. I'm leaving the office on time. Uh, I'm going to speak on a panel and like this is what's going to happen you know you you should be ready for this if you're going to make those sorts of threats and um, and which was basically unfair on my part because I was like being a dick to her for everyone else who was calling and being a dick to me all day and mm-hmm. finally I just had enough you know anyway so I, I go to this um, uh speak on this panel later that same evening and this like young blonde woman approaches me when there's like kind of no one near me anymore and it's like come on (laughs) and it's like um hey i really enjoyed your talk earlier i'm like thanks so much i'm greg you know i shake her hand and she's like i'm and she's like (laughs) no and she was like she was like i'm i'm blank we spoke earlier i'm from Citigroup, and i'm I'm not going to use her name um and i'm like oh (laughs) <laughs> right. Hey, we, we, um, yeah, well, thank, thanks for being here. Uh, I guess we got off on the wrong foot. And she was like, listen, um, you cannot tell anyone that I'm here. You're right. Keep going. I'm going to call you tomorrow and scream at you. Ignore everything I say. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. Anyway, when this book came out, in the front row at my book launch party in, uh, in the West Village at Beta Works, I'm like, there's like, I don't know, 200 people there. And it's like a big night for me. It's my book launch. You've written a book, right? So, and uh, in like the front row, I see this like, like blonde haired woman. And I'm like, that's so, I know I know her face. And it's uh, Stephen Gates um, was interviewing me for my book launch party. He's a really good friend of mine. And I'm like, I'm like, I know I know that face. I, I know I know that. Anyway, and afterwards, she comes <laughs> up and she's like, Greg, that was great. I'm like, hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure that we know each other. She's like, yes, we do. So, I was that person from Citigroup that uh-huh. all those years ago. I'm like, oh, my God. So I feel like this is like 
<laughs> some full circle shit where like you put good karma out in the world you say the right thing you stand up for what you know to be true and like at some point mm-hmm. the circle comes around everyone the good karma like yep. releases its power releases yep. its energy uh the good guys win yeah it's uh Perfect. yeah <laughs> <laughs> what is a great story and in the uh, last part of uh, our talk i want to Uh, ask you something about the old New York, like because uh, you are New Yorker. You were yeah. born in New York, and yeah. uh, you lived in a uh, Rockaway Beach. Yeah, that is a cool neighborhood. So tell me awesome something about uh, New York, how it was in that time, <laughs> or do you have some funny stories? Oh, uh, do I have funny stories? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, because I guess the uh, New York is a little bit different these days than uh, sure. it was. So. Well, what was what is the main difference? Or wow, um, there is so many differences. Um, <laughs> I can tell you something that happened to me recently that just like brought me back to the way the city was. So my wife is from Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she's from Glasgow originally, and, and Glasgow has kind of gentrified a bit since I, I lived there for about four and a half years, and. Um, There's a the east end of Glasgow is one of like the toughest, shittiest neighborhoods, mm-hmm. certainly in the UK. Um, in my, I was I was back there in August, and um, and I, I kind of I I used to like it there. It was like it was dangerous and kind of gross, and too many drugs, and a lot of people fighting, and like bad food. It's certainly not like Prague. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's this constant like sense of menace. And uh, and I'm like you know and it's I was like I'm gonna go for a walk in the East End because why not it's daytime I'm gonna do it and I I, I, I and I was like as I'm there I, I just started like walking and thinking and I'm like you know why I love the East End of Glasgow because it reminds me of what Times Square was like when I was a kid <laughs> like Times Square today is essentially a mall yeah right an outdoor mall. <laughs> with lights lots of big lights Times square when i was a kid was like pimps and drugs and hustlers and it was dangerous and it was shitty and you know uh you and i both grew up with a healthy love in our heart for punk music some of my first shows going to see great punk bands was like in a basement like going past like a junkie shooting heroin at this bar <laughs> called Siberia in Times Square. <laughs> and it was some of the best punk. And I was like, I don't know, 13 or 14 with my big brother who's four years older than me. And he uh-huh. kind of brought me with him and his friends because he's awesome. And I was like, initially, I'm like, all right, I should not be here. But as soon as everyone's like, no, you should be here. This is where you yeah. belong. We are your tribe. So You get a lot less of that now, mm-hmm. um, but for me, uh, it's still that city for me. Mm-hmm. I still walk down like Little West 12th Street in the West Village where it's now the meatpacking district. Right, yeah. And, and I remember going to see ska music at Kareem. Mm-hmm. I walk by that corner and I can hear like the ska punk shows mm-hmm. from my youth. I know what the crowd was like outside. I walked by where Wetlands used to be in Tribeca and I like, I hear the spin doctors. Mm-hmm. Like I hear, I hear the, it's very much, um, it, it's not nostalgia even. Mm-hmm. Like I literally can mentally time travel as I walk through the city to what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, So I think I think people come to New York today and they have this experience of it being trendy and gentrified and swanky and, and beautiful and and I, I do too. I, I, I appreciate all of those things about it, but the past of what it was like when I was a kid and you were always you're always one block away. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy who sold you pot outside of the punk show also sold crack. <laughs> You know, the guy that couldn't, like, find a woman to take home at the, at the club would go down the block and pick up a hooker. Mm-hmm. 
you know, you're always one block away from like the anarchy and the chaos and the creative uh, magic that all of those like crazy anarchic forces just brood and fed. And it still lives in the city. Like that force is still, in my view, it's alive mm-hmm. in Bushwick, right? Okay. If you go to Bushwick yeah. and you want to see a punk show, you will see a great <laughs> punk show and right. the people who are going to make it are, are starving, you know? And it exists. I don't think that ever gets extinguished yeah. in New York, but um, yeah, it's a really, and Rockaway, sorry, I'm, I'm speaking too long and too nostalgic, no, but it's, it's one of my it's, favorite it's, topics. <laughs> That's um, why I was asking you this question. So, so. Rockaway, when I was growing up, was uh, it was an Irish, predominantly Irish neighborhood uh-huh. next to Howard Beach, which was a very mobbed up Italian neighborhood where John Gotti lived. Okay. And next to Arvern and Far Rockaway, which was one of the toughest, most dangerous black ghettos in New York. And they used to bust kids from one part of each of those neighborhoods to my elementary school. And it was not, um, you go to Rockaway today and you can have like tacos and go surfing. And it's, right, yeah. it's sort of this little Riviera. Of it seems New York. like a v- v- very calm part of the city. Right. Uh, and it was calm. It, you know, we would like, swim in the Atlantic Ocean, but like there were race fights. There were racial riots all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, there was um, Howard Beach was one of the worst when I 1987 Howard Beach outside of New Park Pizza while I'm in elementary school. uh, Some black guys went in to get a slice of pizza and some local Italian thugs just murdered them for being black and walking into Howard Beach. Wow. And that was next door. And like in 1984, I remember uh, there's another Gregory in my elementary school class. And he, um, in his backpack, he brought a, a tape player and he, he played, he played uh, Run DMC. The first time I'd heard hip hop. Mm-hmm. Run DMC came from Hollis, Queens. That was two neighborhoods away. Like it was a local, we had no idea uh-huh. that what we were experiencing mattered on a global scale it was like this type of music coming out of gregory linton's cousin's you know uh, neighborhood right we didn't know that run dmc <laughs> was like oh wow that's like a global musical phenom i had mm. no idea um so that was uh yeah that was what it was like growing yeah. up in new york back then i i definitely think that it, it uh would be maybe the the best uh, period uh, in in history to live in New York to see the difference. Maybe uh, now the New York will be much more boring in the future. In it's not more boring. Oh, uh, what I feel is that if you are visiting the new neighborhoods like Hudson Yard, is it's boring. It's just boring. Uh, a glass and and nothing sure. uh, and metal. And of course, if you are living, I was living in Melbury Street next to Chinatown. So Chinatown is funny. I still a lot yeah, of fun there. Yeah, it's great. Sure. But the new buildings and the new neighborhoods that, that are rebuilt and uh, there are houses of uh, big corporations, it seems to me that uh, nothing, uh, nothing interesting is there. Like, yeah, that was also there when I was a kid. Yeah. And sure. I mean, the 1980s stock market boom in New York. Uh-huh was uh, literally like the movie Wall Street was pretty accurate. Okay. You know, it was like <laughs> alpha male, the beginning of, of the You stock. mean Wolf of the Wall Street? That too. Yeah. You know, it wasn't false. Okay. And, the, and that was a very real thing. Um, and I remember that very, very well. I remember that. Um, the thing about New York is you don't have to, it's so big. And there's this constant flow of people who's, um, you know, kind of living out the Emma Lazarus poem on the Statue Mm -hmm. of Liberty. It's like, give us your poor and huddled masses. They can be whoever the fuck they want to be here. And and, and you you don't have to be born in New York to be a New Yorker. Right, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that happens in Prague. I would imagine for you to consider yourself to be Czech, you probably need to have been born here. Well, after one, <laughs> after one year in New York, I I starting to feel a little bit like New Yorker sure. already. So. And no one, no one from New York is going to be like, no, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> because my, my parents, my, 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 uh, my dad was born in Brooklyn, but my mm-hmm. grandfather on his side was born in the Ukraine. Okay. Um, my, my mom is from Romania. She's a New Yorker. Like, no one says she's a New Yorker with an asterisk okay. <laughs> next to her name. No, like, she has an accent. She speaks to me in a different language, usually. But um, she's a New Yorker through and through. Um, my neighborhood is a Polish neighborhood in Greenpoint. Mm-hmm. They speak Polish. And me being a white-born New Yorker, there's nothing about, there's no, like, claim I have on my citizenship of the city different than theirs. They own the neighborhood. I live there too. Um, that's really beautiful about it. The, the, everyone's pursuing a dream. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that dream is to like escape um, some sort of oppression or poverty or suffering. And, and sometimes that dream is I'm going to create I'm going to loop some tape so that my favorite beats from a disco song go back and forth over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to call it hip hop, you know, <laughs> or sometimes that dream is like, you know, Patti Smith moving there from uh-huh. southern New Jersey. And it's like, I have a vision of like the most straight to the core of mm-hmm. my being punk music. And I'm going to call it punk and I'm going to name the album Horses and it's going to be. And it's going to leave an imprint on the universe. You know, everyone goes there for something. But that, yeah. that energy is as, yeah. as alive today as it was at any point in my life. Yeah, you know, I love Prague, but I love New York too. And to, to have a, uh, th- that kind of amazing experience to live in those two cities, it's great. the combination is great to me. I, you yeah. know what, man? Like walking around Prague the past um, three days while I've uh-huh. been here, I really am like, oh, it is so nice to not have the energy of New York <laughs> exactly. City constantly yeah. like, yeah, exactly. yeah. go faster, move, <laughs> go, 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 go. It was so like, you know what? This city has not, it's changed a lot since the last uh-huh. time I was here in the 90s. But at the end of the day, It's a beautiful, old, classical city. It's not in a hurry. Right. It's exactly. not, it doesn't, it doesn't like the energy of this place is like, you know what? We got this, right? We've been around a long time. We're not in any hurry to do a makeover of our town. We're doing just fucking fine. All right. Yeah. Everyone relax, have a beer, chill. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, walking around here over the past few days, I'm like, yes, please. I could use a little break. <laughs> so I think that this is the best ending of our podcast because we should have a Czech beer outside. And guys, thank you for listening. Definitely read uh, Greg's book. And I'm looking forward to the next episode. Bye bye. And Greg, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was this a pleasure is great. to have you. Yeah, there. awesome. Thanks so much. And thank Yay. you guys. <laughs>